Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead and open your Bibles to the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Hallelujah. Don't you wish you were youth tonight? They got Krispy Kreme donuts. They got... Chocolate covered Krispy Kreme donuts. They got powdered cinnamon sugar powdered Krispy Kreme donuts. Milk, orange juice. Anybody, anybody excited? Well, you're not. You're too old. Hallelujah. Uh, we're talk, talking about the new birth, and in talking about the new birth, uh, we're, we've come to this point of how can we really live like who we are? How do we live like who we really are? Oh, and by the way, we got the new baby in here. We got a first time visitor outside the womb. Hallelujah. Little James Hawk Lee Wood is here. Hallelujah. After, I guess, Tiffany spent a week in labor. It seemed like that, didn't it, sweetie? Hallelujah. Glory to God. How do we live like who we really are? Well, first thing is you've got to become spiritually minded. In order to live the way that God intended for you to live, you must be spiritually minded. Your mind must be about the things of God. Amen. Let's go to Romans 8, starting in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Uh, and and um, well, I'll, I'll say this in a minute. For the law of the law, Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but who walk after the Spirit. Now, Weist has an interesting way of saying this. He says, for those who are living as not dominated by the flesh, but as those who are living as dominated by the Spirit. And that's exactly what we're talking about here, not being dominated by the flesh. Amen. As, as new creation realities, as new believers in Jesus, I mean, our new creations, uh, the reality is we're to walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. Our flesh is not to dominate us. Why? Because the flesh operates in the realm of the, of, of the kingdom of darkness. Amen. If you yield yourselves, uh, you know, under sin or the, or the dominion. Remember, we talked about this a couple times in the past few weeks. When we yield ourselves as servants to the dominion of sin or to the dominion of darkness or to Satan's kingdom, amen, we'll die. Amen. Actually, if, if I can get um, some, if I, my wife or one of my kids, go to my office and, and on my little uh, table beside my chair is my Weast translation. There's some things that I wanted to read. Hallelujah. So if you find one of my family members, hallelujah. Glory to God. For they that are after the flesh do bind the things of the flesh. See, when you're fleshly minded, you'll, like, you'll, you'll, you'll obey your flesh. When you're carnal minded, you know, to be fleshly minded or to be carnal minded are, are really synonymous terms. We're making reference to the same thing. We're making reference to a part of your, of your being, of your entity. Now remember, 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says that Paul prayed that our whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the, the, body and the spirit are not the same thing. So you are not a body. Now, we like to say it this way. You are a spirit. Why? How do we do your spirit? Because God created man in his own image, after his own likeness, after his own kind. God is a spirit. Thus, man must be a spirit if he's in, if he's in the image of God or the ki a kind of God. Okay? Man must be a spirit. So what's your body? That's your, that's your earth suit. That's how you're able to function in this realm. Now, Paul said this, that the body without the spirit is dead. Didn't say the spirit stops existing and, you know, ceases to function. The body does when the spirit leaves it. So man is a spirit. We are a spirit being housed in a physical body. Okay? And this physical body allows us to function in this physical realm. So we, we are creatures of two realms, the physical and the spiritual. 
but the spiritual is the higher realm and it is the realm that, that should dominate. Actually, it does dominate whether it's in the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. Well, when it says on the, on the, on the spine, expanded translation. Yeah, one with the blue paper sticking out of it. There you go. Thank you, sweetie. Hallelujah. She brought the other word studies with her. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, just because I'm using weeds doesn't mean I don't agree with everything he says in his commentaries and stuff. There's, you know, there's some things. I, he calls the Christian the believing sinner, which is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. The believing sinner. Anyway. Um, listen, to, he says here, um, condemning son, uh, his son, lightness of flesh, and concerning sin, condemn sin in the sinful nature in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be brought into completion in us, not as dominated by sinful nature or ordering our behavior, but as dominated by the spirit. We're to be dominated by our spirit. Now, being dominated by your spirit, your spirit's in tune with God. Thus, you're being dominated by God's kingdom. Remember, we were translated out of the kingdom of, his, of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, one translation says. All right? We are translated out of the kingdom. We've been translated. For, we, we have a transfer. We've been transferred from the authority or the dominion of the kingdom of darkness. We now operate and function under the dominion or the authority of the kingdom of light, God's dear son. And thus... We are to understand who we are. We've got to be spiritually minded. See, you're, you're taught. One of the things that Satan did in the fall of man was make uh, man live according to his lust and his appetites, to his carnal senses. What did, what did Paul write in one place? Um, that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. Here's an interesting statement. Neither indeed can be. Well, what do you got to do to your mind? It's got to have a metamorphosis. It's got to have a change. You got to renew your mind to the word of God. Amen. Why? Because if you don't, it's carnal. And it's not subject to the law of God. And it can't be subject to the law of God. Carnality is not subject to the law of God. It will not function under the authority of the law of God. It's rebellious against the law of God. Thus, you must renew your mind so that it becomes a spiritual mind, so that it is, it is a spiritual mind, not a carnal mind. What happens when you get a spiritual mind? It's subject to the law of God. Amen. And, and listen, a willing subject. See, the, the spiritual mind is willing to be submitted to the law of God, wants to walk according to the word of God, has a desire that way. Amen. But the carnal mind is, is enmity. It means it's against. It, pre, it works against. It, it resists. It's always striving against the things of God. That's why you get people who say, well, I'm a, good, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I want to do this and I want to do that. And you continue to live according to the lust of the flesh. And, and the Bible says, you know, uh, put off the old man and put on the new man, which is created in God, that, uh, created in Christ, uh, uh, after Christ in righteousness and what? True holiness. It's carnal mindedness to think that you can do anything you want to do in your flesh and it not affect your walk with the Lord. That's carnality. That is an enmity against the things of God. When God says, I, I be holy for I am holy, says the Lord. Amen. Now, well, you know, holiness isn't in your how you act and what you wear and what you dress, uh, but it will affect it. How you act, how you dress, what you say, what you do, affect, it should be affected by what's on the inside of you. That's why we want to become spiritually minded, okay? Well, actually, it's right here. So if you're carnally minded, is death. And be spiritually minded, is life and peace. What, um, but the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can they, can be. Hallelujah. But as for you, you are not, you know, um, for to be habitually dominated by the sinful nature, put their minds on the things of the sinful nature, but who, those who are habitually dominated by the Spirit put their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to have the mind dominated by the sinful nature is death. But to have the mind dominated by the Spirit is life and peace because the mind dominated by the sinful nature, here, here, listen to how he says it, it's hostile to God. It's hostile to God. Carnal minds are hostile 
to God or toward God. Now, King James said the same thing. Sometimes we just got to get a different word, make it kind of click with us in our, we don't talk some of this, those weeping, you know, there's enmity against God. We, we can kind of figure out what it means, but uh, we say it's hostile. For it does not, it does, it does not, listen to this, it does not marshal itself under the command of the law of God and neither is able to do so. Wow. It doesn't do it and it's not even able to do it. Has no desire to do it actually. Its desire is to fulfill the appetites and lusts of the flesh. Remember this, that the three sins that Adam fell for in the garden in the three, are the same three sins that Jesus was tempted with in, in, in the uh, uh, wilderness. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Adam fell for all three. Jesus overcame all three. Amen. And a carnal mind just feeds those things. I said a carnal mind feeds those things. Where does sin, where, where, where does sin take root and take hold and lead us? In the mind? Why do you think there's so much visual things going on in the world today to lead you into sin? Now, we know, we know pornography is a, is a major problem uh, with Internet, smart, I mean, smartphones, everything else. I mean, there's just access to all kinds. And, and these people are evil. Yeah. They're evil. Yeah. They're, they're demonic. They, they hide behind the Constitution. And, and you know, there was, a, there was a place at one time some kid, went, the teacher sent the kids home to get a report on bunny rabbits. And when the kids went home, because they're trying to teach them how to use the Internet and stuff and do a report, little, I mean little third or fourth graders or whatever, go home and type in the word bunny and Playboy comes up. Yeah. And that's just evil. Yeah. They, that was deliberate. It wasn't, it wasn't a mistake. It was deliberate. Well, the parents should have better sense. Listen, we got a whole generation of parents who don't know, that don't know squat about computers or how to protect themselves or anything else. They're trusting that the company they're buying stuff from has helped protect them. And they're not. They're, they're evil men with evil devices and evil, evil purposes in the earth. Let me say this. If they're not born again, they are subject to the laws of sin and death. They're subject to the dominion of Satan, and he's operating in them. Now, they may not be, you know, walking around, you know, with, with satanic robes on and sacrificing babies, but they still, their mind is a carnal mind that's not subject to the laws of God. And so they'll think and imagine stuff and think it's okay, and they won't have any problem with it. So there may not be a, you may, you may be able to find a conspiracy in the natural, but there's a conspiracy in the spirit realm where Satan is dominating carnal minds and causing evil thoughts to come and men are carrying out those things because they're, they're not subject to the law of God. They're evil people. If y'all here, you're going home. And so, um, where were we? Okay. But because the mind dominated by a sinful nature is hostile to God, for it's not, uh, it does not marshal itself under the command of the law of God, neither is able to. Moreover, those who are in the sphere of the sinful nature are not able to please God. Wow. Now, what, what gets you into the realm of the sinful nature? Let me say this, folks. He's talking to Christians here. This is not a letter to, the, to unbelievers. So what puts the Christian in the sphere of the sinful nature? not walking according to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We are to, and when we, Paul gets to Romans chapter 12, he covers this. You know, he just didn't stop here in Romans 8, and, you know, and, and that was the end of his, his, his doctrine. But when he got on to Romans chapter 12, let me see if, see if I'm finished here. Yeah. Let's, let's go on here. So they that are in the flesh are dominated by that sphere or, or in the, uh, cannot please God. But, if you're not, but you are not in the flesh. Now, we says that a little bit different. Um, but, uh, but as for you, you are not in the sphere of the sinful nature, but in the sphere of the spirit, provided that the spirit of God is resident in you. 
But assuming that a person does not have the Spirit, God's Christ Spirit, this one does not belong to him, but assuming that Christ is in you, and on one hand that the body is dead on account of sin, but on the other hand the human spirit is alive on account of righteousness, and assuming that the Spirit of the one who raised up Jesus from among the dead is resident in you, he who raised up who raised from the, uh, among the dead Christ Jesus will also make alive your mortal bodies through the agency of the Spirit who is resident in you. So then, brethren, we are, we are those under obligation. I like this. We are those under obligation. Not to the sinful nature to live habitually under the dominion of the sinful nature. For assuming that you are living habitually under... No, listen, I, see, King James makes it sound like you're automatically doing it. Have y'all noticed that? Look, look where it says um, over here. Because I read it sometimes, I see, well, I see what somebody could take this out of context, make it go say something they didn't say. Um, we, 13, therefore, brethren, we are, not, we are debtors not to the flesh, live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die, but through the Spirit, you demortify the deeds of death, you shall live. For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Well, did I just jump right over that? Hello. Hallelujah. And we're, on verse, we're on verse 17 here. All right. It says, but we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be the spirit. Okay, that's where we started all, that off at. Um, I'm about, I, he doesn't have these verses marked off. That's why I'm trying to find it. Hallelujah. Y'all hang with me just a second here. I'm trying to find this place. And assuming the spirit of the one who raised up Jesus from among the dead is resident in you, all right, therefore, da, 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 da. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead, da, da, but the spirit of him raised up Jesus from the dead, that's where, verse 11, hallelujah. Oh, we didn't get into verse 14 yet. Okay, that's why I'm, I'm back up here at verse 10, 11, and 12. For we, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if through the spirit you do mortify the deeds of the flesh, um, he says here, and King James says, for um, as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Uh, we says, for as many as being consistently or constantly led by God's Spirit, these are the sons of God. Amen? Notice what he says here, back up in this, in this previous passage. For assuming that you are living habitually under the dominion of the sinful nature, you are on the, you are on the way to dying. But assuming that the Spirit that, that you are habitually putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So, you know, what Weymouth does do, I mean, not Weymouth, Weiss does do, he really gets into the tenses of the verbs. Now, King James a lot of times say, we're not, you know, we're, we're not, uh, we're not um, but you're alive unto Christ, and he'll make it in the sense that, you know, you're automatically going to be doing certain things where, where Weiss would come back and put it in a tense. If you're doing this, then you're going to do this. See, a lot of times you will say something, uh, you know, you're, but you're not in the body, you're, you're, you're alive unto God, and it's really, it's not in quite that tense because people say, oh, I'm not, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm alive under God and I'm not in the body and it doesn't control me. But well, praise God, I can do anything I want to do. And that's not, that's not the way the Greek is saying it out anyway. You can read your whole Bible. And you, if, if you just have an honest approach to the word, you can't, you can't come away from it with that. Yeah. You can't by leaving out passages. You know, they got a new Bible out called the, Qu the Queen James Bible. The Queen James all the scriptures that deal with homosexuality are left out. They just leave it out. Now, I got news for you. If you got one, I'd get rid of it because the Bible says, he who takes away or adds to, let him be a curse to death me up. Not a good statement. Completely rewriting, completely changing the Bible to fit the Queen James. They know better than that. They just want to hear what they want to hear. You can't have what you want to have and leave out the other stuff. All right? Uh, verse 14, for as many are being consist constantly led by the Spirit, God's Spirit, they're the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery again with resulting fear, but you received the Spirit who places you as an adult son, where we cry, we cry with deep emotion, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself is constantly bearing joint testimony with our human spirit that we are God's children, and since children also heirs, and on the one hand, heirs of God, on the other, joint heirs with Christ, provided that we are suffering with him in order that we also may be glorified together. For I come to, uh, re to a reasoned conclusion that the sufferings of this present season are, are of no weight in comparison to the glory which is about to be revealed to unto us. 
for the, con, con, uh, uh, well, we need to stop. That's where we need to stop. That's where we are. So you've got to have a renewed mind about spiritual things. We're not dominated by the spirit. I mean, by the flesh. We're dom be dominated by the spirit. That comes as a result of being spiritually minded. You can't wake up in the morning and say, well, my flesh feels like doing this, and because I feel like it's okay, I can go do it. That's carnal mindedness. When you look into the Bible, and the Bible says don't do it, well, I don't like that, so I'm leaving that part out. Well, you're just stupid then. I don't, I, I don't mean to be ugly, but it's, that's just stupidity. You can't look at the Bible and find something that says don't do such and such, and you just say, I, I, I ain't doing it because I don't think that's right. People have used the love of God to cover up people. You know, nobody's going to hell because God loves everybody. Come up with universalism. You know, everybody's going to get saved. And they forget to go back and find out that God did love the world, and he loved it so much he sent his son to be a sacrifice to redeem them that if they'll believe on him, they'll not perish. That's what the love of God did. See, man was destined to hell. He sent Jesus as the redeemer to redeem them from hell. He said this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. So what did the love of God do? It's not that a loving God sends people to hell. Everybody was going to hell. The loving God sent Jesus to make a way out and if you'll believe on him, you don't have to go. That's what the love of God did. It's not that a loving God sending the people to hell. They were already all on their way. They were already damned to eternal damnation. There was no way around it. Except Jesus came and made a means of escape. That if you'll believe on him, you'll have everlasting life. You'll not perish. So what the, the love of God did do something. The love of God did make a way. But the love of God, did, it's not the love of God sending people to hell. It was the love of God making a means whereby a man can make a choice and not go to hell. And the choice was to believe on him. So the argument that a loving God won't send people to hell is flawed from the beginning. The premise is flawed. That it is God sending them there. Hell was made for Satan and the fallen angels. And the rebellious human spirits or, or humanoid type spirits that preexisted. Now, this is what I believe. Before the, before the first flood, between Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2, I believe that's where demon spirits came from. The angels are reserved in chains. I believe James, or does it say, is it Peter, 2 Peter that says that? Or James, I forget which one says it, the other, or Jude. It's one of those guys. It wasn't Paul. But they're reserved in chains. And so they were, their, their destiny was hell. And then eternal death in this lake of fire. That's the second death. Eternal separation from God. When Adam committed high treason, man became associated with Satan, his kingdom, and its destiny. Which was eternal damnation. Jesus came in order to redeem man and give him the opportunity not to suffer the consequences of Satan's destiny. So it's not that God is sending people to hell. It is that man, rejecting Jesus Christ, punches his own ticket for hell. The love of God gave up his own son because it was the only way to redeem man. Man got us into it, and a man had to get us out, but no man born out of the lineage of Adam, fully born out of the lineage of Adam, in other words, his spirit being coming from, from the procreation from Adam and Eve, his spirit had to be given by God into a virgin, and she gave the flesh, but God gave the spirit. Hello? And then he came in the form of sinful flesh, in the form, not, it wasn't sinful. Thus, he walked as the man that God intended Adam to walk as, pleased the Father, and then was sacrificed on the rest of humanity on for their behalf that he could be raised up from the dead, and anybody who would believe in him would be raised up spiritually with him. And ultimately, you get their glorified uh, body, but you know, it was a spiritual thing first. God's love gave up his son to redeem a rebellious people who rejected his mercy and his plan. So the love of God 
It's not that the love of God, a loving God, that a loving God will send people to hell. A loving God gave his son so people wouldn't have to go to hell. That is the premise, and that is the right way. So the argument that people see, it's a carnal argument. And what that argument is all about is to lead people to, th to say, it doesn't matter if I believe on Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if, he's, you know, uh, if, I, if I do this or that. A loving God would never send a human to hell. But Jesus, and now listen, folks, we, we got all kinds of stuff going on out there. We got pastors saying, you know, that Jesus is just one of the way. And, you know, we got cr supposed Christians saying, well, you know, there's other ways to get to God other than Jesus Christ. You can go through Muhammad, or you can go through Krishna, or you can go through the Reverend Moon, or whoever. You know, you don't have to believe on Jesus. But Jesus made a statement. Now, his statement eliminates any other possibility. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Pastor, if you're preaching anything else, you're a liar. Supposed Christian minister, if you're saying anything else, you're a liar. And you're lying to people. And their blood will be on your hands when you stand before the great white throne of judgment. When you stand before the master, when you stand before the head of the church, when you stand before the one who shed his blood to redeem mankind, and you told people there was another way, you're going to, stand, you're going to have to answer to God. You cannot be philosophical and call Jesus a good man among many good men. Because he's either who and what he said he was, or the biggest liar that ever walked. Can't have it both ways. You can't get philosophical and say, well, he's one of many prophets. You know, Muhammad was one and Jesus was one. And they all lead to God from a different path. <laughs> when was the last time you got a flying raspberry? I didn't do it real good, but that's okay. If I got on the camera, I don't want to do that. Jesus said he was the only way. He said you can't get to the Father except by him. There's no other way. Well, if, if there's no other way, there's no other way. He didn't say there's others who come before me, there's others who come after me, there'll be a way. Hello? Actually, matter of fact, I think the scripture, he would cover, the scripture even covers, there'll be many that say they're Christ. You know, there'll be many and come and claim to be Christ, but they're not. He was the only one. With that being said, we have to understand the need to live in the realm of spirit, spirituality that is coming from our relationship with God, being new creation, new creation beings. We are a new creation. We're born of God. We're born again. We're born anew. The word uh, that where Jesus says in John 3, you know, you must be born again. Um, that, that can also be translated born anew or born from above. However we say, you know, some people even say born again. You get some old country folks that said, they must be born again. Hallelujah. Well, I don't you know how he preaches good, though. Get your old preacher, he's born again. Yeah, that's good. I'll, I'll get you going. Hallelujah. The life on the inside of man is where to live from. And we have to have a spiritual mind in order to walk in there. You can't be constantly being dominated by a carnal mind that is yielding you, your, your being to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and expect to get ahead, and expect to win, and expect to live in the realm of the Spirit. Hello. Well, I'm going to go out here and do this, 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 and this, but I'm going to show up at church, and, you know, and, and it's all good because I'm going to heaven no matter what. Well, you know, and we get more and more and more and more and more people. We know this, the, the, um, the, the extreme teaching on grace. I believe grace is a tremendously powerful Bible subject, but it's been hijacked by people who are misusing it. Same way that people deal with faith. People started taking faith, and you could believe somebody else's wife, somebody else's car, somebody else's house. You could believe for $10 billion, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And if you'll give to the preacher up here, then you're giving up, and you're going to have a, you're going to have you a million-dollar payday coming and all kinds of crazy things. They hijacked faith. It's not, that's not Bible faith. Hello. That's out, that's out of balance with the Word of God. Well, you know, well, how do you know that believing someone else's wife is, is the man looks on another woman to lust after her has committed adultery. Adultery is a sin. What if God shows me she's supposed to be my wife? 
Uh, yeah, it's, it may have been God, but his name is Beelzebub. Translation, Lord of the Flies. Further translation, the Maggot King. All right? Eating the refuse of the world. Not refuge, refuse of the world. Are you here? Carnality. Remember that the prodigal son came to himself. What was he doing? Eating pig slop. Satan will take you down a path that looks glorious to start with, but in the end, you're going to end up eating pig slop. How many of you ever slopped the hogs? That just ain't a pretty sight. They'll eat stuff that turn your stomach. They'll pull up to that trough. You got all the, the pot, what they call the pot liquor and all the leftovers and all that stuff. It just doesn't look appetizing. Anybody ever slapped the hogs thought that looked look good? Anybody thought it looked good? No, I didn't think so. You think, how, how can they eat that? And he kind of walked away and said, I don't care as long as they get to eat them later. When you had the hog killing, you know, when you make all the bacon and the sausage and the, you know, all that other stuff. Glory. But we don't want to eat the pig slop of the world. We want to eat from heaven's table. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Glory to God. That's what we're supposed to be eating. We're supposed to be eating at a table that the Lord's prepared before us but in the presence of our enemies. Glory to God. But you don't get there eating pig slop. You get there by being spiritually minded. Amen. The carnal mind's enmity against God. It works. It's hostile toward God. It works against God. So what do we do? Now, we've taught this, and we've even said some things about this recently, so we, but we can't bypass this in this teaching. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Man, he's talking about, he just, you know, God be merciful to help you do this. That you present your bodies. Did you notice he didn't, did you notice he didn't say present your spirits a living sacrifice? See, so present your body as a living now, uh, sacrifice, which is your, now King James uses the word reasonable, but uh, if you'll go study that, that word just means spiritual. Now, maybe in King James times it meant something along the line of spiritual, I, I don't know, but I wasn't around in 1611. All right? And neither were you that wear your 1611 KGV hats. You can't even understand the thing. If you get a true 1611 King James version, you can't even hardly read the thing. It's so, it's so antiquated in language to us. All right? So, but, you know, which is you know, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye trans. Now, what would world conformity be? After we just talked about in Romans 8. What word would we use to, to, to equate world conformity? Come on, somebody. There you Carnal. Carnal. The world is carnal. Paul wrote, I believe it was Paul wrote this. He said this. He said, the wisdom of this world is first earthly, sensual, and devilish. I'm sorry, James did. That's why I said I believe. Thank you for finding that for me. James said, the wisdom of this world, the sin not from above, the world, the wisdom, and he's talking about before that was the wisdom of this world. Um, is for earthly, sensual, and devilish. Now, back in Romans 8, he says, be not conformed to this world. Well, let's, let's look over here in James just for a second. You know, when you, when you get in trouble, you just always require, say that Paul wrote it. Because he wrote so much. Then you get in trouble because it wasn't him. Hallelujah. Look here in verse 13 of James 3. Who is a wise man and do with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation. Old King James for uh, lifestyle. His works with meekness, his works. I'm so fed up with people saying, you know, you can, you know God didn't require works. You know, the Bible says we're created in Christ Jesus under good works. Ephesians, the second chapter. There should be good works coming out of your life. If you're born again, the life of God's in you. There should be good things coming out of you. Amen. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, remember he talks about who's a wise man and do with knowledge among you. But if you've like, you got bitter envy and strife and glory not, uh, this wisdom not, is not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. 
For where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. So the, the, the wisdom of God is a completely different animal. But the wisdom in this world is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Now, Paul tells us in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans that we're not to be uh, carnal. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Then he comes over into the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, tells us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, as a spiritual service to do so. And then he follows that up, and be not conformed to this world. We know that the world is carnal, that the dominion of Satan is a carnal dominion. Even the wisdom that flows out of it is earthly, sensual, and devilish. The Bible has a lot to say about, uh, well, sensuality leads into sexuality and all kinds of, you know. And, and when you give, give, lead to it, give, uh, uh, give heed to it, when you give heed to it, it will take you down paths of, of perversion and rebellion against God working all manner of uncleanliness before him. That's the world. It's, just, it's, it's earthly, it's sensual, it's devilish. The body of man was not given so that it could fill the appetites of, of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It was given to man so that he could operate in the realm that God created as, as an under ruler over God's creation. It was, his it was his functioning apparatus in order to exist in this realm, but it was to be submitted and yielded to God. Paul went on further, and back, well, back over in the, in, 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 further in chapter 8, and also says some things in chapter 6, about not yielding your members as servants of unrighteousness, but as servants of righteousness, servants of unrighteousness unto what? Death. But yield them to, as servants of righteousness unto life. So we come to Romans chapter 12, and Paul, Paul hadn't stopped talking about these things. He's, not, he's using different terminology, but he's still making reference. See, if I wrote you a letter, and this is a letter, so we, can, we break it down so much we, we isolate when we read the Bible a lot of times. Well, we'll take Romans 8 and just read Romans 8 and not read Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, or 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. We'll just pull out 8, and we'll read stuff in there, and we'll, we'll pray, but we, you know, we, and then we go to 12, and all of a sudden we just pull that out, and it makes 6 say something different. No, all this is tied together. It's a letter to one place. So Paul, you know, when he, when he gets to Romans 12 and says, be not conformed to the world, Romans 8, Romans 6 are all in the background and the undergirding of what he's writing in Romans 12. It's not another letter. So when he says be not conformed to this world, he's talking about don't be functioning under the kingdom of darkness. Don't be functioning under the dominion of sin. Amen. Do not let those things rule and reign over you. And you will not let them rule and reign over you. Now, Paul establishes you don't have to. You're freed from sin. He who's dead is freed from sin. But let me say, there's enough instruction further on in his writings and even in the book of Romans that lets us know that you've got to put something in operation to, to maintain and demonstrate that freedom. Because if you yield yourselves into the, to the word, the Paul says, don't be conformed to the world. If it weren't possible, he wouldn't have to have said it. Are y'all here? Some people say, you can't sin. Paul said, don't be conformed. You don't tell somebody don't do something unless it's possible that they do it. It's like me coming home, you know, get ready to leave the house and looking at Nathan, Shannon, or Jesse, or whoever. Well, Jesse wouldn't be there anymore <coughs> unless she's coming over for, <coughs> for supper or to visit. They do, they, they do do that. Hallelujah. But looking at Nathan or Shannon saying, don't drive the van. And then I take the keys and drive the van out of the driveway and leave with it. Now, why would I tell them that? Because it would be impossible for them to drive the van if I'm out driving it around town. It would be foolish for me to say that. When Paul said don't be conformed to this world meant that there was a possibility that they could. Had to be. Or else he wouldn't have told them not to be. And so he says don't be, be not conformed to this world but be transferred. And then I love this. 
Notice he didn't tell you how to be conformed to this world because they'd already experienced that. He didn't say, be not conformed to this world by yielding to the flesh and living in the flesh and doing the flesh. He said, don't be conformed to it. But, so we have, you know, I, I, like, I like this term. He has, we have a thesis, not, don't be conformed to the world. And then we have an antithetical statement or the antithesis or the antithesis. It's pronounced antithesis. But if we hyphenate it, it would be antithesis, okay? But the antithesis is, but be transformed. Paul doesn't stop there. It would be, it would be, you know, woo! We're not to be conformed to this world. We're to be transformed. He didn't say what else, man. Can you imagine if he died right then and never didn't finish that? We wouldn't know what to do with it. We'd be sitting there going, "Well, how do I be transformed?" You'd be watching Star Trek, thinking you're getting ready to get beamed up or something. Amen. He says, "Be transformed by the renewing of your mind." So Paul tells us that the that the arena in which we Break free from conforming to the world. Now, let's see, you're born of God. You're born again. Your spirit's alive unto God. But you can still be conforming to the world in that new creation state. And Paul warns us not to do that. Then he expresses how we don't do that, by the renewing of your mind. Well, James gives us some insight into how to renew your mind. Receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save. That's the word is sozo in the Greek. And it's not talking about spiritual salvation in this case. The word can be it's translated mostly in reference to the spiritual salvation. But it's also translated to mean to make whole, preserve, restore. Okay? So, you know, uh, heal. Actually, it's being used, translated to be heal. So, uh, you could, you know, somebody, if it's talking about the flesh... You know, and, and, and you couldn't see in the Greek, and Jesus sozoed them all. Well, they didn't, they didn't get them all saved, but they got healed. So the word's translated. It, it's a, it is the verb, and I know we said this enough, but for people who don't hear, maybe tuning in, never heard this, it's a short lesson. There's, there's a, there's a, the Greek uses the verb as the meaning, and the, the nouns come out of that meaning. And so we, it's in English, it's reversed. We go, to the, we go to the noun, and then we get the verbs, Okay. So if we have the noun, we have the meaning, then the verb is the action of that noun. Greek is backwards from the us. It's, it's probably, you know, maybe we get, the, we get the action, and then we get the noun from that action. The, the uh, noun equivalent to sozo is soterius, salvation, okay? And both the verb and the noun carry, cover the same thing. Salvation includes healing of the body and salvation of the spirit. Okay, so the sozo, what they refer to this in, 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 um, um, in, in word studies is the sozo word group. Okay, so we have the sozo word group, the word sozo, the word soterius, the verb and the noun. And, and sozo means to heal, to make, to preserve, to make whole. It, it's covering the spirit. Actually, there's, there's, a, there's an application, spirit, soul, and body. James says, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to sozo, now to restore, to make whole. Your soul. Again, here, he uses the word suke and not pneuma. See, pneuma is spirit. can be translated spirit, wind, breath. But, it's in, in, but pneuma is in reference to the spirit of man. See, we don't get that revelation in the Old Testament. The, words, the word for soul is, is used interchangeably for spirit and, 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 and mind in the Old Testament. But in the New, there's a distinction made. More revelation given by God. They weren't, they weren't ready to understand they were spirit, soul, and body under the old covenant. They just had to obey the law and do what God said until Jesus could get here. Then you got born again. And the revelation began to flow from the ministry of Jesus. Lest this man be born, born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. You know, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay? And so Paul gets over here in Romans, the 12th chapter, and says, you know, be not conformed to this world. Do not operate under the dominion of the law of sin and death. Do not operate under the kingdom of darkness. Do not, uh, do not operate under the former nature. Don't operate there, but be translated or transformed by the renewing of your mind. James tells us that the renewing of the mind is to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Remember, he's talking to Christians. They're already born again. So saving their soul cannot be getting saved. Right. It's something different. What is it? Renewing the mind. It makes you able to prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. 
It breaks you out of the shackles of conforming to the world and through the what, becoming spiritually minded. Amen. We are thus able to walk out of the new man and walk in com com uh, harmony with God, thus pleasing God. Because we're not walking with a carnal mind. Remember, the carnal mind is enmity against God or hostile to God, and it cannot be subject to the law of God. And so they that are, that are spiritually minded, you know, are please God. They please God. When I said they please God, if you're not carnally minded, if you're, if you're spiritual minded, you please God. Well, what happens to the spiritual being? Well, one of, the, one of the aspects of the spiritual man is that he's a man of faith. God's dealt to every man the measure of faith. What? Go back and look in Genesis. Up until Adam committed high treason, he was a man of faith. The moment he committed high treason, he became a man of fear. Now, fear is simply perverted faith. In other words, fear is fed from a different dominion than faith is fed from. Faith is fed from the dominion of God's dear son. It is the laws of God, the word of God, the, the promises of God fed to the human spirit that God's going to do what he said he would do. And believing what God said produces faith or is faith. Acting and believing what God says is faith. Fear is getting information from the kingdom of darkness. And fear, meditated on and fed on and believed, produces faith in the words of Satan. So fear is simply perverted faith. It's just getting your information from the wrong place. And you're acting on it. People who are in fear, will act, they'll do some of the dumbest things. Amen? People who are afraid do some of the dumbest things. They act out their fear and they end up getting the results of it. Because it's a part of who they are. They're so, full, they're so full of fear. And see, fear is nothing but believing in, 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 in the words and the promises of the kingdom of darkness. Letting it feed in your mind and you feed it on it, confessing it and saying it and declaring it and acting it, And then you go out and act on it because you believe it. People who are so full of fear will go out and act on their fears. And it'll come to pass. So it's a perversion of what we, we, we're supposed to walk in faith. The new creation man walks in faith. Why? Because he's alive in the God. He's in communion with God. His mind's being renewed to do what? Prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Can you say amen? All right. We're going to pick up here next Sunday morning, and we're going to go on with this. We're going to conclude for right now. Hallelujah. Uh, this, is, this, is good, this is good stuff. And we can't come back and have every service like you had this morning. You know, we're not, and we're not going. We're not going. We're not going to uh, get yield to the flesh that wants to have a, a Holy Ghost outpouring service. Hallelujah! Just because your flesh wants it, if God wants it, we go do it. Listen, did y'all find out this morning if God wants to stop me from saying anything and goes a different direction? God can do that. Now I'm yielded to Him. I'm submitted to Him. And the reason he was able to do that is because I'm yielded to him and submitted to him. He wanted to go a different direction, and I yielded myself to him, and he just took over. I couldn't even, I couldn't even speak English. I tried. Every time I tried, I couldn't get there. I'd say, I got it this time, you know, because I knew uh, somebody came up to me after service and said, you know, I was about to get up and say, we're supposed to come down and pray in the Holy Ghost. And by that time, I started waving everybody to come down. You know, they were, they were hearing from heaven. I, I, I knew that. I couldn't say it. Well, you can't have that service every time. Now, we want to, but then you won't get taught, and then you won't be able to renew your mind, and then you won't be able to break the conformity to the world, and then you won't be able to prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. You'll just go on about, about your business. You know, whoo, praise God, I had goosebumps today. Glory. You'll carry me to, through to next week. And what happens if you don't get a goosebump service next week? I see people be up here. I mean, they're, they're, they're in the stratosphere. One week, crashing and burning the next. Well, we, we want, what we want to do is we want to learn how to walk consistently 
And then when God calls us to have a special time in his presence and a special uh, 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 access to a, uh, the glory and the anointing, glory to God, we can just rejoice and shout and run and hallelujah, but we don't, when we come down, we don't crash and burn when we come down out of the stratosphere. We're stable. We're steady. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button thank you and may god richly bless you for your giving